was the centerpiece of the new government under Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Even as we meet here, he is in Mongolia right now, having reminded the Indian community in Shanghai yesterday that while they would be resting on a Sunday, he would be working as he always does, but this time in Mongolia. Uh, foreign policy is extremely important, as we all know. And we also know that our last Prime Minister Manmohan Singh mistook diplomacy and protocol as admiration. And our, Pre our Prime Minister now, Mr. Modi, seems to be mistaking it for adulation. We have an excellent panel to discuss the implications of the last one year. On, and foreign policy, as we know, always impacts on domestic policy and vice versa. We have Ambassador Nirupam Sen, a well-known diplomat with years of experience behind him. And we have senior journalist who writes regularly on foreign policy, has edited various papers, Siddharth Bharadarajan. Thank you. Uh, well, foreign policy is uh, actually one of those areas that Modi's critics and supporters both prior to his becoming Prime Minister had some doubts or apprehensions about. As Chief Minister for 12 years, Modi uh, had had obviously limited foreign policy experience. Although Chief Ministers have been playing a larger role in the last decade and a half in the execution of Indian foreign policy than they have ever done in the past and Modi was one of those more active ministers on the circuit as far as traveling abroad to get foreign direct investment or interacting with investors and so on. He came to office essentially with a strong, with this strong mercantilist idea of what foreign policy should, should be all about, that promoting trade, promoting investment. So this was what we knew about him. He had made a couple of speeches on foreign policy prior to the election, which threw up ideas. Uh, some interesting, some confused. For example, he in Chennai spoke about the importance of states increasing their role. He said every Indian state, for example, should adopt five countries in the world and uh, be responsible for building closer relations. Interesting ideas. Uh, the BJP also, as we know, brought with it uh, to power a considerable amount of foreign policy baggage. Its attitude towards Pakistan, its attitude towards China, its attitude towards Bangladesh. Uh, they had been sharply critical of all attempts to build bridges with either Dhaka or Islamabad and had essentially criticized the last 10 years of Manmohan Singh uh, on the China issue by accusing the government of being weak need, not responsive. So there, there was a resumption in the uh, strategic community among those who follow foreign policy that, that Mr. Modi as Prime Minister would adopt a more shall we say, muscular approach towards certainly Pakistan and China and perhaps also be um, willing to push ahead with the BJP RSS view as far as some of India's other neighbors are concerned, particularly Nepal, where the RSS was never happy with the abolition of the monarchy and Bangladesh, where the Sangh Parivar finds it impossible to look at one of India's most important neighbors through a frame other than what they call this problem of infiltration. Indeed, if you look at the otherwise fairly lackluster performance of the government on the economic, social, political front, lackluster to even negative, it's not uncommon to, to hear people uh, praising the foreign policy approach of the Narendra Modi government. What I would like to do in the 10 minutes I have is essentially to bring out precisely where are those elements where Modi has done well, where are the elements that uh, he hasn't done so well? Are there some areas where there is considerable amount of confusion? And what could be uh, some of the changes that we would like to see that, that ought to be made in his foreign policy approach so that India has uh, a more balanced foreign policy, a policy driven by uh, India playing a more forceful, positive role as a factor for peace, democracy, and uh, a more equitable distribution of power in the world. So, so that's the frame with which I will quickly run through. And it, it, it'll be clear that, that if you look at Modi's foreign policy, uh, and I don't just mean the 14 visits he's made, 
for the overall change, changes that he's brought about. There are strong elements of continuity with Manmohan Singh. There are clear areas where he has brought about improvements. And there are clear areas where there is considerable amount of confusion, which to my mind, uh, in some cases, um, borders on indecisiveness or perhaps even on uh, a tendency to take wrong decisions. And I will run through these. Let's start with the elements of continuity. Even if the broad foreign policy approach is still the same, it was good that Modi uh, cast aside the views of those in the RSS who said Nepal should be should revert to Hindu being a Hindu kingdom, or you know, he he didn't endorse any of that. And essentially, the Indian approach to Nepal is the same. But you have this added personal touch, which is welcome. Similarly, in Sri Lanka, where the Indian official line towards the Sri Lankans is roughly the same, although there was some confusion in the initial months of the Modi government when elements of the BJP and RSS tried to cozy up to Rajapaksa and imply that Rajapaksa was India's preferred partner in Sri Lanka. But with the change of regime in Sri Lanka and Modi's subsequent visit, you know, it's clear that there's a strong element of continuity and the fact that Modi was able to visit Colombo and Jaffna, I think, is a positive element. Bhutan, of course, was a country Manmohan Singh visited, so that's nothing new. Uh, Pakistan, however, remains one negative area. You invite Nawaz Sharif, you tweet that you've had a wonderful personal relationship. The two leaders are saying how we exchange, we send shawls and saris for each other's mothers and so on. A date is set for the two foreign secretaries to meet in August. Prior to that meeting, for about 10 days, Srinagar is full of uh, the news that Huriyat leaders are going to be coming to Delhi to meet the Pakistan High Commission, High Commissioner. It's no secret. Everybody, the man on the street knew this, so you can imagine that the IB and the police also knew it. Messages are sent to Delhi prior to uh, Gilani Saab or Shabir Shah coming to Delhi. Ki ye log aa rahe unko roka jaye, kya kiya jaye, koi instructions humko mile. But not, no message was sent to them from either the PMO or the Home Ministry. These gentlemen land up in Delhi. And shortly before they uh, go for their well-scheduled, previously announced meeting with the High Commission in, in Delhi, the Modi government wakes up and says, hang on a minute, uh, uh, this doesn't look good. And they give Pakistan an ultimatum that they know Pakistan cannot fulfill because Shabir Shah is already in the High Commission by then. That if you go ahead with this meeting, the talks are off. What surprised me was that this view wasn't conveyed in a timely fashion so that the Pakistan government itself could have assessed this new red line that the Indians are drawing so that, you know, and they would have probably judged that, well, there's no point waiving this provocation at this point. Uh, it's more important for the process of dialogue to resume. So the Modi government could actually have had its cake and eaten it too. If, 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 if it had shown a more nuanced, balanced approach rather than politicizing this whole visit of Huryat in order to call off uh, the dialogue. It's still not clear to me why they did this. I don't think this would have been a, this was a big political issue in any state election that followed. And since then, that confusion has manifested itself. You've had, you've had uh, a flare-up on the line of control, and the BJP took the view that for every uh, one round that comes from the other side, we will fire 100. Well, what happened is that a huge amount of ammunition got expended by the Indian side. Lots of civilians on the Indian and Pakistani side got injured or killed. There was no military change. There was no change of military facts on the ground. And eventually, the, uh, the government uh, of India decided that okay, enough's enough. Maybe it's time to find some way to resume dialogue. And the Indian Foreign Secretary was sent to Islamabad under the rubric of furthering SARC. And again, that meeting, uh, you know, if it was a, a suggestion that Modi intends to talk to Pakistan, there hasn't been any follow up. So we don't know where the Modi government stands. On Bangladesh, there was utter confusion uh, where. On the, on the issue of the implementation of the land boundary agreement, where under pressure from the BJP and RSS, the union cabinet actually clears a draft of the constitutional amendment that excludes Assam from the purview of this important agreement with Bangladesh that was negotiated two years ago and which the Bangladeshis consider highly important. Running quickly through other elements of continuity and change, all of you know that Modi has been widely welcomed in the United States. Australia and Japan, France, Germany, Canada. They see in Mr. Modi a leader who can do it and they are excited by him 
fully backing him. Now, they also have expectations which Modi has shown a certain willingness to accommodate. The Americans wanted a dilution of the nuclear liability law. That's happened, even though uh, we have to see in practice how this could be implemented. Uh, the Americans want a dilution of the Indian uh, the intellectual property rights regime. It's very difficult politically for Modi to do that because this means raising the price of medicines, although the drug controller of India has already begun to play with that. But if you mess with the IPR under pressure from the United States, not only will this destroy the Indian pharma industry, but will have huge knock-on effects in terms of the access of not just poor Indians, but poor people around the world which rely on Indian generic drugs. But nevertheless, the Indian and US governments under Modi have agreed to set up a working group to review India's intellectual property regime. I don't know what kind of an outcome is going to come from that, but I think that's something that we need to focus on. Uh, last couple of points. I think there is uh, no doubt in my mind that Modi has decided, as far as the emerging security and strategic situation in Asia is concerned, that he needs to strengthen and deepen or double down, to use Shiv Shankar Menon's phrase, the strategic partnership with the United States. India under Modi seems more willing to be part of American strategic arrangements. The pivot to Asia, for example, the uh, uh, joint statement on a strategic vision for the India-Pacific that Modi and Obama uh, issued in January uh, is a clear declaration of intent on India's part to uh, go along with the United States when it comes to various uh, strategic initiatives in Asia. Now, uh, what impact this will have on relations with China is an open question. It, it does seem to me, based on Modi's visit to Peijing, that both countries, despite being aware of, of the, their own, uh, despite being aware of the fact that they're on divergent strategic vectors in Asia, you know, it's very clear that the U that India is going in one direction. The Chinese are going in another. But both sides, I think, are exploring the possibility of deepening their bilateral relations, at least on the economic front. And if they succeed in doing that, it's possible, and also based on the way in which the foreign policy debate changes in India, and also the way in which the international situation changes, that uh, there may still be time for uh, a cost correction, and that Asia does not go down the path on which it is headed right now of greater um, greater suspicion, greater possibilities of confrontation among the different powers. But as of now, based on the decisions that the Chinese are taking in terms of their overall approach to Asia, of, of sharpening their territorial disputes with not just India, but uh, the, the Southeast Asian countries, Japan, and so on. Um, so, so the Chinese are going in a certain trajectory, and the Indian response to that is to, uh, is to uh, seek comfort in the embrace of the United States in the hope that this would somehow better manage the emerging security scenario, which to my mind is a self-defeating uh, path to go down because that path will only lead to the sharpening of, of contradictions between emerging and established paths in Asia, when the need of the time really is to uh, explore ways of creating a cooperative architecture in Asia that can allow for the resolution of, of, uh, of conflicts um, through dialogue and diplomacy. So as of now, it's not clear in Asia at least what direction uh, Modi is going to take. The signs are not necessarily very positive. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Mm, Ambassador, sir. Uh, well, I'm delighted and honored to be here. Looking at the foreign policy of the present uh, one has to go back to the roots of foreign policy in order to be able to assist. And the roots go back to the Rwanda who was the architect of our foreign policy. Our foreign policy grew out of the freedom struggle. It was committed to independence and therefore committed to an economic model that would ensure this independence. I mean, Nehru put it very well in, uh, in a speech to the Constituent Assembly uh, in uh, 1947, on the 4th of December, that, uh, that, that India's foreign policy is the outcome of its economic policy. Uh, countries respect us because they see us as independent, we cannot be dragooned this way or that by any point. So this is the key. And the foreign policy of Jawaharlal Nehru, of Indira Gandhi, in fact right up to 1991, with certain nuances here and there, is rooted and 
you know, is a part of this economic body which existed from 1947 onwards. From the Mahalo based model, from the abolition of Zamindari, from a certain egalitarian approach, because this is rooted in even the facts as brought out, for instance, by Thomas Piketty, that from 1922 to, the, to 1950, the inequality in India was about 15% to 18%. That is the top centile, uh, you know, of the population. Uh, they owned, uh, you know, 15 to 18%, the difference between what they had and the bottom centile. This figure becomes only 5 to 8 percent during the period 1950 to 1980 and that is very significant. Thereafter it reverts back to what it was. So you have this new classical economist uh, confirming what uh, the Nehruvian model achieved. Similarly the great liberation of Bangladesh, you know the tremendous uh, mobilization of intellectual forces throughout the world, you know from Andre Malraux in Paris to Hannah Arendt in, in, in New York. This again is inseparable from the 20 point program from the nationalization of banks. So, therefore, the economy is central. And there is no point saying that the economy is going very well, the GNP is going very well, and commerce are committing suicide in such large numbers. So, therefore, the economy is not really in crisis. The economy is the crisis. And that is the basic, the, the, the basic point. If you look at the intensive diplomacy for peace, not just on disarmament, but on the Korean War, where there was opposition from first the Americans, then from the Soviet Union and others, then again, you see, you see an intense diplomacy for peace, which since 1991 we do not see. It. The same is true of what Nehru did on Indian China, what Indira Gandhi did subsequently. So therefore, there is a certain background which we cannot get rid of. You know, do away. The second thing is that in 1991, what happens is a kind of anti Nehruvian phenomenon, where the Nehruvian idea of the state is replaced by private property, where the Nehruvian idea of justice is replaced by private profit, where the Nehruvian idea of the rule of law is replaced by unlimited private and primitive accumulation. So, therefore, what happens thereafter? is a very different foreign policy, a foreign policy which is very different from the relationship we had with the Soviet Union. We talk of make in India. During this period, during the period of Nehru, Indira Gandhi, you find that make in India is a reality, whether it is steel or power or heavy electricals, whether it is what we talk about today, the defense industry, and not just from the East, but also from the West. We have, we produce the UK vampires, we produce the NAT interceptors, we produce the Shaktiman tanks, uh, which, which are of German origin. We produce mortars from France. We produce uh, uh, the big interceptors. So therefore, a powerful industry is built up without which our subsequent victories in Bangladesh or against Pakistan would not have been possible. So whether you look at Make in India, whether you look at the impulse for peace, whether you look at the independence of our policy, these, issues, these are all heavily compromised from 1991 onwards because of this anti Nehru in, in, in economics. From 1991, we became camp followers on US terms. That is, that we, we accepted not just an open economy, the Washington Consensus, for which there was no justification. Because many economists know this perfectly well, that in Rajiv Gandhi's period, the, 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 the real economy was doing very well. There was a payments crisis, but there was no necessity to solve this payments crisis. There were alternatives available through the means that were adopted, that is, through the Washington Consensus of Liberalization, Privatization, Globalization. In other words, what was done was to really do what the economic time was disaster capitalism. Through disaster capitalism, it was. Through the dilution of the civil liability, in the nuclear liability in the nuclear liability law and so on. But the roots go back to 1991. The point is that uh, that in, 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 in this article of uh, Shori and, and even more M.K. Narayan, M.K. Narayan and Sanjay Baru incidentally also have a lot of this uh, bogus uh, political geography of Mekinder, a lot of discredited ideas. But apart from that, uh, what 
Kiraya and says with great eloquence, we have lost Iran to China because China was with Iran and therefore now there is a beachhead in West Asia given by the Iranian connection. Now M.K. Narayan quite suppresses and forgets the fact that who is responsible for it exactly? It is precisely the civil nuclear deal that Manmohan Singh worked out. And as a result of the Hyde Act, the vote in 2005 itself in the IAEA against Iran that set the whole process rolling. So I am shocked that you have this kind of argument and total silence on this kind of antecedent. One has to recognize the fact that the Indo-Soviet treaty was reality because it altered the military political situation in our favor. The ninth Grenadiers marching in Red Square is theater. So ultimately the, the politics of the Indo-Soviet treaty was, was rooted in geopolitical reality. So therefore you find, I'll just take two minutes and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude. So therefore you find that that here nothing has come of it. I mean through this civil nuclear deal you have, you have got corruption in the polity, you have got the stifling of democratic dissent, you have, uh, you have set back the, 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 the Janus based program of Homi Bhabha, the thorium reactor, you have compromised the independence of your strategic deterrent. So ultimately one is reminded of that poem by Sade, uh, you know, in which he, in which which goes somewhat like this, that what good came of it at last, quote little Peter Finn, why that I cannot tell Sadi, but for a famous victory. So this is this is this is where we are. But again the question is that having followed the policies which Manmohan Singh followed on economics, on the United States, we cannot mobilize the the non-aligned movement in the way that Indira Gandhi or or uh, or Nehru could mobilize it. So therefore, without that mobilization, how do you get the two-thirds vote to get permanent membership? So while we have gone back to Nehruvian rhetoric, we have we don't have the Nehruvian means anymore. These policies uh, have to be also judged in in terms of the overall constraint of the economy, because there is, given the neoliberal economy, I don't think anything more than this is possible. With that, I will. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm not going to summarize what the speakers have said in their excellent presentations, which I think all of you would have understood. I just want to add a couple of points uh, uh, to uh, Prime Minister Modi's foreign policy. I mean, one thing is, of course, very clear, and uh, and one of the priorities of his foreign policy is used to uh, is to use the world to launch himself. Uh, he had felt the pariah status to a point where now you have big events, larger than life events, as he travels the world. Uh, he has selected the Indian diaspora wherever it is available to, for Madison Garden kind of do's. Now I don't know how this will work and how it will not work. This will, we'll have to see. Uh, uh, of course, foreign policy has become a priority of his government, even more so than many of the promises that he made domestically. Uh, perhaps, like the earlier Prime Minister, he finds it easier to, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to travel the world than to grapple with real issues back at home. There are certain trends that he's left behind in this one year. It's too early to judge foreign policy's success or complete failure, but there are certain trends which are visible. Uh, for instance, um, his uh, West Asia policy is a continuity, but a deepening of relationship with Israel and of course the Gulf countries, but definitely with Israel. He's probably the first Prime Minister who met Netanyahu without doing the balancing act on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly, which created its own ripples in a region which is important and should be important for India because we might have to intervene for a variety of reasons, um, uh, you know, change our policies, um, uh, which were to at one level ignored. The other thing um, is, of course, the South Asian grand gesture of inviting all the Sark heads when he was being sworn in. But this is sort of degenerated or diluted into further hostility or deepening hostility with Pakistan, where even the possibility of talks is not being talked about anymore. With uh, Bangladesh, as Siddharth had pointed out, very uneasy relations, which they are trying to mend now. 
uh, with um, uh, Nepal, what was the big thing which the media and the Indian media thought was the intervention in the floods uh, in the quake situation, but it has uh, earned great hostility with a major signature campaign by almost all sections of society in Nepal asking Indian media and a euphemism for India to get out. So I don't know how this will pan in the Big Brother attitude which clearly New Delhi has adopted towards Nepal. Um, in America, of course, uh, relations, I think there is something there which we have to look at. On the democratic issues, it's the, after a very long time one, remember, one can see that the US ambassador to India has taken a position on the NGOs and the kind of action that the government has been taking. President Obama, and despite these high-level, big growth, development-oriented meetings, didn't leave Delhi without reminding the government about religious tolerance, which was taken up again by Obama at the breakfast meeting in Washington, which was taken up again by the UN, um, by the U.S. religious uh, group, uh, religious tolerance. What is it, the tolerance group? So I think, you know, constantly on democratic rise there are fissures which have not been met. How this works out, how this pans out, whether it's going to have an impact on other issues and strategic issues or not is something that we have to see, but it's there on the ground. Uh, the final point, I mean, there are many points, there are little, little points in all the visits that he has made, which are, which are like a sort of tattered carpet, but you don't know how it's going to go. But two of the main things, one is the Rafale deal. In France, it was a big centerpiece of the French visit. It overturned decisions taken, which we think and we believe and we should believe because that's what the governments told us, was a considered decision taken on the advice of the military that there should be 126 jet fighters and not, uh, but suddenly we were told it's 36. No idea of the price no idea of the technology transfer, no idea of the make in India. There are vague inferences. The defense minister has not answered it properly. The prime minister, after the grand gesture, is quiet. What does this mean? Where this will go? Because these are the kind of issues, as we have seen, the big issues, which seem small, which impact on relations and impact on foreign policy as well as domestic policy as we proceed. The second thing is the centerpiece of the American visit, Obama's visit with a nuclear deal. Our foreign secretary at that time said, announced at a media briefing, the deal is done. But we don't know, even now, several months after the meeting, what the deal was or is. There is fear and there is apprehension that we have given up on the compensation clause, that the supplier, which is the American nuclear companies, will not be liable now to pay the kind of compensation that they should. It's coming on the operator, which is the Indian government, which is then setting up an insurance pool. I'm not going into details. But no matter what, the figures that are being mentioned are far below what can compensate anyone if there is a nuclear disaster. So these are all things, these are also the realities of this foreign policy that they're pursuing. Obfuscation where it suits them, grand gestures where it works and a little bit of good politics here and there. Well, thank you very much to both our panelists, especially for coming so early and uh, meeting the time requirements that we have set. Thank you again.